Welcome back to the show, everybody. XRP's on the move. We're at 56 cents. How about that one? We've got so much more. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and digperspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.47 trillion market cap for crypto. And even though the market is off 1.5%, which is what's so interesting about this, XRP is up. XRP is up. We're 55 cents, actually 56 cents on Fiat Link, as you'll see in a minute. 5.2% in the last 24 hour out of the 87 on the seven day. So in the last 24 hours, XRP has been out for a jog. Take a look for yourself. We're headed towards 57 cents. What's going on here? Look at the, th this is flying off the shelf. Look at these orders right here. Look at all of this taking place. You can see where the volume's going. Head on a swivel, ladies and gentlemen. We got a lot to go over today. Look at the line that was in place for XRP Las Vegas. It took a minute, almost two minutes. And shout out to Trey from XDR, or XRP LHQ. And on XR, XDC, we love him. He was a moderator on one of our panels, so shout out to Trey. And this line is remarkable. And everybody was just excited to get into the room and to get into this event. And I see so many people in here that I know in this line. It's so wonderful. But everything went really good. This was pre before the doors open here, and things were really, really taking off. Now, you have to remember, this is on the first floor. This event was on the third floor. <laughs> So if that give you any kind of notion of what was going on on the day. So this was really, really a remarkable event. And I just, I'm super grateful, as you guys know, there's no question. I, I am super grateful for everyone who attended and speakers and sponsors alike. And by the way, if I could just go back very quickly. Mountain droves. I want to show you this. One second. Let me mute this really quickly here because I want to show you something right here. And it is. There's Bradford right there. And right here. This guy and his mom, Adam and his mother, are some of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. And they were trying to get here. Now, his mom had clearance to come. They're from the UK. But Adam needed his visa clearance. And he didn't get his visa clearance until less than 24 hours before his flight was planned to leave. And, you know, it was just, it meant so much to me because I know how stressed he was, uh, you know, trying to come and to be at this event. And I, I just was so elated for him. I, I almost broke down because I knew what it meant for him and for him to get that clearance. He was so anxious waiting to find out if he was going to go. I mean, it was down to the wire just hours before his flight. So it was really extra special. And this is the kind of stuff that people do to get to these events. And they're really glad when they do. Don't believe me? Ask Adam and his mom. Love you both. It was so great to meet and spend time with you. I want to point this out because we have to remember not only is crypto in a fight, but so is America. America is in a fight to keep and retain its values. And we can't do that when we have somebody like here, like I, Chuck Kane, who is the Nick, Nikki Haley of Massachusetts, which means he's a ploy. He's a plant. He's not who he says he is. He claims to be a Republican, but here he is swinging it up, you know, having fun with none other than the despicable Elizabeth Warren, who has been near feckless, except for causing division. Division is something she's actually very good at. Bringing people together, not so much. She's only had one piece of legislation with her name on it go through in the last 12 or 15 years. She's absolutely feckless unless you're trying to create division. And these are the people we need to send packing. I chuck canes along with it, and we need to put John Deaton in their place. That's what I'm telling you, and this is what's going on here. And they claim that, oh, John Deaton just moved to Massachusetts. Well, you know why John Deaton moved to Massachusetts recently? Because he's a leader. Nobody asked him to fight for the XRP Army, and he did. And nobody's asking him to fight for Massachusetts. He knows they need it, and he's coming. And that's what a real leader does. And I bet you Massachusetts is going to love it when they figure out who he is. I have to tell you, before we get on to the news, and we have some incredible XRP news and, 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 and uh, digital asset news today, I had one of the best conversations, and I mean this, 
blockchain backer. That was one of the most incredible conversations I've had over the entire weekend. And I have been long time wanting to have a meaningful conversation with you. And selfishly, because you're a drummer and I'm a drummer too, and we got to geek out a little bit at the after party with your wife. She was wonderful. It was such a pleasure to meet her. But I have to tell you, you know, uh, blockchain backer said something a few weeks ago about a gap in the community. And blockchain backer was absolutely right. And I made a promise to him and I'm keeping it right now that I, I am inviting him to come on to the show and we're going to show this community exactly how to come together. And I have what I believe is a huge answer for the entire development community, all the developers, calling all developers. I have what I believe is an amazing opportunity to fill that gap for funding and to help close that gap for all of you that are going to be the next Google, the next Amazon, or whatever it may be. I have a plan to build a bridge and bring you guys into the fold of XRP Las Vegas, get you the attention to your projects, and help you find the funding. Write it down. I don't say these things unless I mean them. And I mean them. And I know that blockchain backer means the things that he shares. It meant so much to me to hear his points of view from feedback he's hearing from the other half of the community. And it meant so much to me because he's so great at articulating these things for the community and the things that he's observing, right? And he did such a great job sharing those points of view of others that I really took it to heart. And I am, I am committed I am committed to helping close that gap. I want to say it. And we have the power of XRP Las Vegas, not just our channel here, but XRP Las Vegas that I want to bring to that commitment. And we're going to do it the right way. And we're going to make sure that we help mass adoption on every layer when it comes to this. I appreciate you, man. Look forward to him being on the show. This here is David Schwartz. We all know he's a legend. And you know what? This is a legend clip. Now, I'm not going to play the whole 11 minutes, but I do want to give you the first couple minutes because it's about automated market makers. And I know a lot of people have trouble. They struggle to understand these things, the concepts of how they work and operate. And I, nobody's better to say it than David Schwartz. And you'll certainly be more confused if I say it. So why don't we hear him break it down? Let's talk a little bit about the importance of automated market makers, also known as AMM. So what is an automated market maker? So an automated market maker is something that sort of adapts the time between buyers and sellers. These exist in many traditional markets. If you have a broker and you go to buy stock in a publicly traded company like IBM, there is a healthy order book of people who will buy the stock from you and people who will sell the stock to you. And there are professionals whose job is to make sure that that market exists. They trade on um, these ex the exchanges and they generally get preferential access to the exchange in exchange for committing to keep those sort of spreads tight on the market. An automated market maker is the decentralized version of the same thing. It's always willing to buy and sell an asset so that if I want to buy an asset today and maybe Rachel wants to sell it tomorrow, I may not wait to want to wait until she's ready to sell, and she may not want to wait until I'm ready to buy. So an automated market maker has a pile of two assets, let's say USD and XRP, and it's always willing to buy XRP, and it's always willing to sell XRP at some price so that other people can trade whenever they want. But there's another important thing about automated market makers compared to like the more traditional market makers. Because the automated market makers are implemented on decentralized blockchains, you can participate in an automated market maker not just by trading with it, but also by a sort of the equivalent of lending an asset. So remember I said the automated market maker has to have some USD so it can buy XRP whenever someone wants to sell it. And it has to have some XRP so it can sell XRP whenever someone else wants to buy it. And what an automated market maker does is it makes a return. It generates revenue from various different mechanisms, including the spreads on its trades. And if you lend it your, asset, your XRP or your USD or both, then you own a sort of share in the automated market maker and you, you benefit from the trades that that automated market maker makes. And one of the things that I've noticed in this space is that a lot of ideas that don't seem that interesting from one side are, are very interesting from the other side. Like for example, there are these lending protocols that are mostly so that like rich people can spend their Bitcoin without having like income to pay income tax. 
that's not super exciting, right? Like you can borrow against it and that's not taxable and like really rich people want to hold their Bitcoin, they made millions of dollars and now they can buy groceries without paying taxes. That's not super exciting. But on the flip side of that is someone who's lending the dollars that has a very valuable collateral, who has a secure loan that they're making an interest rate on and that person might have had no ability to get a return on their assets. <clears throat> the counterparties to the AMM traders, and maybe you don't care about traders and speculators being an arbitrageurs being able to make money, but it's interesting that you have a way at a fairly low and well understood risk to get a return on your assets by participating on the other side of the AMM. There you have it. <laughs> and I tell you what, I don't need to add a thing to it. It's David Schwartz. You just got it the way it is. The only thing I would say is, is what's so exciting here is that the bigger the, the TVL gets in these automated market makers, you know, to supply the market with the ability to make transactions without having to go to centralized order books, the more amazing this becomes because that's the vision. That's the vision. And we're watching this happen. I'm super geeked out, excited right now. <laughs> I really am. But you know what? We got to pay attention because this is what has happened to the old system. I want you to listen now to Jared Bernstein. My God, shout out to Chad Steingrober and Radar Hits for this one. This is the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors president for, uh, for President Joseph Bi Joe Biden. Jared Bernstein, I want you to listen to this. I want you to tell me about what's going on here. This is our U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we print our own money currency. Uh, I can't even. This is unbelievably hilarious and scary, I might add, Chad, right? Give Chad a follow. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why do we borrow our own currency in the first place? Like you said, they print the dollar. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets, some of the language that the MN, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? They, they, um, they yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, oh yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I don't, I can't really talk. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, cause mm. it's like the government clearly prints money. It does it all the time and it clearly borrows. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So I don't think there's anything confusing there. How scary is that? Right? How scary is that? It's unbelievable. This is, you can see it right here, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. This jackass can't even explain money printing and borrowing the own money from the country. My gee. This is why, you know, I get excited about automated market makers because I know that they got a bunch of people out here that are absolutely crazy. They don't know what they're doing. Well, not crazy, but they're just, they don't know what they're doing. They're not fit for the role. That's the bottom line. They're not fit for the role. This guy can't even explain the basics of the monetary system, for God's sakes. Uh, something has to be done. And in order to get a new financial system, there's going to be a com combination of precious metals, gold, and commodities alike in order to bring all of this together. And I can't play this clip for you because I, I, I couldn't get it to get sound. So I don't know if there was no sound on it originally or what happened, but I wasn't able to get sound to play. But shout out to Rob Cunningham. Give him a follow, obviously, on that. And then here we see Ripple Reese Merrick at Swell. And we announced HSBC, one of the largest gold bullion providers, is tokenizing gold utilizing Ripple custody solutions. This is why we have a gold panel. 
because we know there's going to be this huge cooperation between using precious metals and commodities to underpin the new financial system. Don't believe it. It's still true. Listen to Ripple's Reese Merrick. Um, you know, at Swell last, um, in, you know, in November, we were able to announce that HSBC, who are, to you know, the large bullion provider globally, one of the large bullion providers globally are tokenizing gold, right? And they're utilizing our custody solution to do so. So, you know, HSBC... Pardon, sorry? The Luxembourg Exactly. So we have we acquired Metico, grade enterprise grade um, custody solution, working with um, top financial institutions, and and from our perspective, it's been you know a win win, both taking those customers forward, expanding the business, and being able to drive new business there. Wonderful, and it is happening. That's proof that it's happening. And let me tell you something else. I got to meet this OG right here. If you ain't giving him a follow, it's Bank XRP. What a beautiful guy, and what he has done for so long for this community. My gracious, man! And to finally close that gap and get to meet, and I got to spend time. Look, I got to be honest. I was fanboying a little bit. I've been following Bank XRP since before I was even a YouTuber, man. So you know. You know, for a lot of people, there's like a big deal to you know, meet you or DAI or other, you know, Mickle Markets or Zach or all of us, right? You know, but it was extra special, man. I got to meet Bank XRP, you know what I mean? But I got so jacked up, I forgot to get a picture. So, Bank, we got to fix that. <laughs> it happens when you get a little starstruck, you meet somebody, you're like, you know what? Shit, now I forgot to get a picture. So, we'll, we'll take care of that, Bank. I promise. I promise. Um, Ron Hammond, shout out to him, being asked here about all of what's going on in the Ripple uh, versus SCC case. Take a listen to this. And this is really, uh, this sets everything up where we're going for the rest of this video. You're going to want it. Where would it be good for the crypto industry as a whole? Where would that, where, where would that fine have to land to say, okay, that's a good win for crypto in general? But uh, I, I personally am not a legal expert here, so I won't uh, pontificate about what the you know, penalties should or shouldn't be. Huh. But at the same time, the industry's playing offense. And I think that's good to have. And, you know, Ripple, to their credit, was the first one to play uh, offense and fight the SEC and show that it's possible. Um, but it's crazy how much money that these companies have to spend to defend themselves. And again, mm -hmm. if Ripple does get a fire or not. But the amount of money, and again, we're talking in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions sometimes to defend themselves, um, that's what it takes to operate in the United States. And that's a really sad reality. Uh, and I think that, if uh, you know Capitol Hill understood that a little more, um, I think it'd be you know at least a wake up call to do something here because uh, the only folks getting a lot of money out of this is the lawyers. I mean, we have some really great ones, but at the same time, it's crazy how that's the kind of cost of doing business. It's just how much legal battles you're going to fight here, whether justified or not. Uh, I, I think Ron's got it right here, and you know, obviously, super sharp man, Ron's so smart. Look, um, you know, he's pointing out the obvious here. That this process of just, you know, uh, you know, regulation by enforcement is crushing the companies that don't have the money to fight. And that's a part of the attack mode. That's the reason the SEC is doing this. So they can crush the smaller companies that can't afford to fight. And they just scream, I want to settle. I talked to a former securities litigator that said that about their own clients even. He's like, you know, we get excited and be like, hey, we can beat them on this issue. And they would, their clients would say, no, 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 we don't want to beat them. We have to continue to work with them after this case is over. Just settle. Just settle. Right. Because of the fear of angering this regulator that not only is there this issue in front of us, but they're the regulator that has to continue to oversee us and our market that we're in. So we don't want to upset the apple cart. That's normally the approach when it comes to the SEC. And now we're down to the ripples, the circles, the upholds and all the other behemoths out here that have to really put up that fight. Not that circles in it at the moment, but and I don't expect them to be. But, you know, uh, Coinbase and Ripple and Grayscale, everybody else who's been in this fight, and it's not over yet. And it looks like Ethereum has just gotten herself a seat in the boat as well. Now we see this. The SEC files a lawsuit against Robin Hood's crypto business, issuing a Wells notice to the company. Again, it's continuing. They got the money, and thank goodness, because they're going to need it. 
Now, this from Eleanor Terrett is a reminder. Remember the hack that happened to the SEC back in January 9th? Well, she's following up, and the latest update from the agency on January 22nd stated that it was working with the Office of the Inspector General and several outside agencies, including the FBI, about the incident. But apparently in 23, the SEC OIG got an independent company to look at this information security program, which includes cybersecurity, infrastructure security, and found it was lacking. The report is buried on the SEC's website and dated December 20th, 2023. The hack resulted in reported losses of around $90 million in Bitcoin liquidations, according to Coindesk. Gensler also did not mention this report in his response to members of Congress regarding the hack. Imagine what the SEC would do if a public company knew vulnerability, didn't correct it, and then got hacked. Will the SEC have any repercussions? The full report is in that post. Then we see this. Here we go. The plaintiffs, and now we see a new lawsuit against Coinbase claims that Algo, XLM, Solana, Mana, Matic, Near, Uni, XTZ are securities. Here we go. From Mason versus Lewis here. Uh, and then we see a Bill Morgan here. The plaintiffs are losers who knew crypto was speculative but want to sue someone for their failed speculative investments. So it's a bunch of truck dump mess is what this is, he's saying. So... Nevertheless, the fight and the battle continues. Once this suit goes into place, it is now a matter for the courts. And we all know how ridiculous this is. The SEC could clearly put a bullet point one pager on their website, offer a safe harbor, and we could be off to the races the next day. It is despicable what they're doing. I want you to listen to this. Speaking of, well, let me play the clip and we'll get to it here. Speaking of uh, secondary exchanges, which you just mentioned, um, it, it reminds me of the other big legal domino that has yet to fall, and that's the Ripple case, right. which focuses specifically on whether XRP is a security. Right. Right? Uh, it seems like in that case or in some related cases on that topic, uh, the courts can't agree on what the right approach is. I was a little surprised by that. Um, in reading, for example, Judge Torres's you know opinion, sure, sure. one of the first ones that came out, sure. um, you know, Neil, can you explain what's going on here? Because th this is pretty confusing. In fact, it, it almost represents, to think, a lot of other people that uh, there is not a single way for the SEC to look at this. I, yeah, I, th I think you know it, you're, you're absolutely right, Ming, that this has been an area of like judicial disagreement. In, and, and it's funny because Listen. all three of the judges who are, who are relevant here are, are in the Southern District of New York. So, like in a single federal district, the judges can't agree on on, on what uh, how these secondary trading uh, how the secondary trading of crypto should be treated. And, and it's helpful maybe to just set the stage a little bit here and, and say, you know, uh, the question here is. Judge Torres says, you know, in the primary offering of XRP, people know they're buying from Ripple and they're relying on Ripple's efforts to make a profit for them. So that makes it a security. But when you're buying on an exchange, you don't know who you're buying it from. They're, these transactions are what she called blind bid-ask transactions by often very unsophisticated investors who, who you know, aren't parsing the, the marketing or, or stuff like that very closely. They don't have any expectations in the same, from Ripple in the same way, according to Judge Torres, that primary purchasers do. So she says secondary trading of crypto is different and doesn't involve securities. But then you've got Judge Rakoff in, 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 the, Terra Lua, in the Terra case, which, which involves Do Kwan, and, 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 and then you've got recently uh, Judge Faya in the, in the Coinbase decision, and they both take the view that, no, if you look at the amount of marketing that these crypto companies are doing and the kind of marketing they're doing, they're reaching both primary and secondary investors, and so secondary trading of crypto is also securities trading. And so they disagree with, 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 with uh, Judge Torres. So I think it's inevitable that this is going to go to the Second Circuit and, and maybe even further. Uh, and maybe even further means the Supreme Court, as we've said. Uh, who knows? But uh, so there's a, a lot left to go in this in this particular uh, in this particular decision. Just like with Coinbase, I think it, it, you could see it go all the way. And I think the other thing that I would I would sort of say here is that the SEC doesn't see the. I, I think the SEC doesn't necessarily see the Ripple case as being a failure uh, of its theory that that secondary trading of crypto is uh, securities trading. They just see it as maybe we couldn't put forward the evidence uh, sufficiently well.
to, to convince the court, and we'll fix that at the Second Circuit level. So, you know, again, just to echo Dax, lots of, lots of litigation left. Lots of litigation left. And that's why I believe where he's there mentioning the idea of under or at least the understanding that you have these disagreements within the same circuit about how this stuff should be looked at, viewed and treated. Right. So this is one of those things that goes to appeal. And if it doesn't get solved there, it's going to the Supreme Court. But it doesn't mean that uh, Ripple can't continue to grow. It doesn't mean that XRP adoption can't continue to grow. Of course it can. And we're going to do everything from this channel to do that as well as affect policy for the entire crypto space so that America can continue to be a leader in the fourth industrial revolution. Right here, we see very quickly before we get out of here, boy, do I like looking at these charts with XRP moving a day. He says, egg rag crypto, give him a follow. 53 to 58 cents, and we're close to it, right, is crucial, is crucial. Recent weeks show a strong base forming, hinting a potential bullish run starting at 58 to 58 cents. We're at 56, ladies and gentlemen. 63 to 70 cents make a sentiment shift. Monitoring this range volume provides insight for seizing price opportunities and managing risk. 75 to 85 cents will signal a start of a bull run if we close it uh, weekly above weekly. And it says here, a monthly closure will mark the end of an era below $1. Did you hear that? Let me read that part again very quickly here. Uh, we will, uh, 75 to 85 cents will, start to sign will signal the start of a bull run if we close above it weekly. And a monthly closure above that will mark the end of an era below $1. How about that one? Hello. 93 cents to $1 is where the emotions clash, fear, greed, anxiety, overconfidence. A monthly close above this range could mean saying goodbye forever to prices below a dollar. Whoa. Follow the technical analysis, not emotions. Stay disciplined and avoid letting emotions dictate actions. Trust the charts, he says. I tell you. Well, you know what? We are. And while we're trusting the charts and just letting them play out the way they need to, you can see all these areas that he highlighted. I'm super excited that we're all here on this journey. And Dark Defender echoes something similar here, but goes more macro with it and says, engines ready for XRP, getting back into the triangle. As you can see right here, road to $1.88. Watch out, ladies and gentlemen. This is super exciting. Listen, we're getting ready to go into the Freedom Zone. And boy, have we got something for you today. It's the food supply. And you won't believe it. They've already captured a huge part of it. And we're going to show you exactly how they've done it right now in the Freedom Zone. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. Come on in. Digperspectives.com. Click the Freedom Zone. All right, 